Rings of Power Episode 1, where the dialogue felt like someone trying to tell me how intelligent they were while simultaneously gargling on their own urine. Now, the episode was, overall, very pretty, and I've only seen episode 1 so far. But your first episode is supposed to be the best, it's what gets everyone hooked into the series to continue watching. You can expand on all the characters later down the line, but the first one has to be good. And so if this is their best work, I'd hate to see what's coming in the future. <laughs> But we start with a nose. Look, it's a new production. The cameraman hadn't got used to his zoom yet. We get this line. And there was a time when the world was so young, there had not yet been a sunrise. I'm pretty sure that was my argument about elves. But this first scene is a load of young elves, and we really want to front load the gargling. We've got Mini Galadriel building a ship out of some kind of posh paper, and we get the bullying arc. You see, the reason Galadriel's so strong and powerful later on is because she was so vulnerable when she was a child. She went through a great period of trouble and strife, and only through challenge and personal growth did she become the great person she was meant to be. I'm sure that's the line Hollywood's gonna give her, right? Because this guy is up to no good. He sees Galadriel building the ship and decides to show the fact that he has about the mental capacity of a slog. Not sure if that's his fault or the writer's. Is it finished yet? Oh, it's nice of him to care, isn't it? But as she goes to put the ship in the water, we get the full impact of the intellectual capacity which we're about to see throughout this entire series. You could have possibly believed their old scrap will float. It's a paper boat, mate. What do you think it's gonna do? I mean, look, I know elves were the first people to appear, but surely they must understand how basic buoyancy works. And bullying doesn't actually work if what they're saying would get laughed at by a five-year-old. Although, to be fair, if she's gonna get bullied for anything, it should be this next line. It's not going to float. It's going to sail. Literally the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you show me a sailboat that isn't floating, and I'll show you people who need a new boat. But her paper boat goes down the river, floating. I don't know why we're all amazed that paper floats. As long as it's got some kind of waterproof base, it's fine. But then we get even more of just people staring at each other across the river because this is really exciting entertainment. Remember when I said your first episode is meant to hook you into a series? Yes, if this doesn't get you hooked, I don't know what will. But then by magic, I assume it's magic and not physics, it all unfolds and it gets wings. That's still floating. Even if you define that as sailing, it's still floating. And I wouldn't define that as sailing. But obviously the guy on the other side, he can't handle being wrong. So he has to sink it and starts throwing rocks at it. <laughs> Stop, stop, as we run along and just stare at each other across a river. Oh, deriveting. But then she dives across the river screaming stop. Honestly, I'm not sure why she's so concerned about a piece of paper. And tries to stop him throwing rocks, but is so physically weak she can't stop him lifting his arm and throwing it. That's worth remembering for about five seconds later. Because he overpowered it, threw the rock, and sank the boat. So she charges him, despite the fact that she couldn't stop him throwing something, tackles him to the ground, and obviously instantly wins without any struggle whatsoever. Do you really think that you would get bullied by a person if the moment they tried to do anything to you, you did this every time? Do you think professional boxers get a lot of stick as they're walking down the street by random people? No, no, no. It doesn't really happen, does it? It doesn't really happen. But then she gets interrupted by her brother, who is proficient at trying to sound intelligent while simultaneously getting everything wrong. But he fishes a boat out the water, and I have to say to the showrunners, why do you hate hair? But what follows next is a conversation that can only be described as painful. Do you know why a ship floats and a stone cannot? Because a ship displaces more mass than the mass of the ship, and a stone doesn't. Buoyancy, folks! I'm sure he's going to say something very similar. Because the stone sees only downward. You what? Look, I know these are elves, but they've been eating mushrooms or something recently. A stone doesn't even have eyes, mate. The darkness of the water is vast and irresistible. Where are you going with this? But the ship has a secret. That might be the single best face to describe what on earth is going on. He's like, oh, the stone looks downwards at the dark and gets drawn in, and the boat that can also see the darkness down below and draws it in, but the ship has a secret. For unlike the stone, I guess it's not downward up. A ship doesn't look down into the water. It looks up at the light. Seriously, dude, what have you been smoking? Did you pass it around at the early viewings? Is that why the reviews were so good? Because, uh, is this what we're going to get? I mean, at least when she starts talking BS, they just limit it to a bumper sticker. They don't try and turn it into an essay. But have you considered that Galadriel, even at this young age, is just so clever? But sometimes the lights shine just as brightly reflected in the water as they do in the sky. That's not as deep as you think it is. I don't know what you think is going on here. I can't say which way is up and which way is down because the light is reflected everywhere. If you can't tell the difference between the sun and the ocean, there's n there's no saving you. There really isn't. But she says, how am I supposed to know which lights to follow? And he leans in and whispers something to her that we don't know. 
And for that, I'm grateful. Because every line I miss in this show is just another brain cell saved. But that seems so simple. A lot like the showrunners. The most important truths often are. Like how buoyancy works. No, they're speaking in grand metaphor. You just don't comprehend the sheer intellect required. It goes over your head. Sometimes you can just preemptively predict the comments. <laughs> And he says, you're lucky they are, because I won't always be here to explain such things to you, which given the quality of his advice so far is probably a good thing. Because you're supposed to pass on knowledge and wisdom to the younger generation. Whereas this guy is just passing on what he knows about pontificating, which is quite the skill I've mastered myself. But as Galadriel has proven herself to be someone that gets bullied, but also can't get bullied because she's too strong and powerful for it, we move on. That was at double speed because they're so slow, but it's seriously, the entire episode is that repeated on loop and it's driving me insane. But then she goes, we had no word for death. And I kind of wondered why? Look, I understand that you are immortal and no one had been killed yet, but you still should have a concept of what it is before it happened. What would happen to me if I jumped off one of those mountains? Probably need a word for that. But no, we say it because it sounds deep, even though it doesn't actually make any sense. And then we get this line without a single hint of irony. For we thought our joys would be unending. With that face. Oh, I've never seen someone happier in my life. But then we get the landscape that you've seen from the trailers and the trees which gave light to the earth before there was a sun or two. Then we get an extremely quick shot of the trees before in comes Morgoth and his shadow creature Spider Woman, which they don't even talk about. For anyone new here, I do not remember names. I cannot remember names. It's, it's one of them things. We're just going to get used to it. I remember things by description. Hence, Shadow Spider Thing. <laughs> That's also why characters and reviews get nicknames. Bicycle Helmet Man from She-Hulk. And this isn't even what happened. It's like Morgoth is taking the light from the trees. No, no, he didn't. It was the shadow spider creature. And I've just thought that is from how far I've gotten to the Silmarillion, but they don't have the rights to the Silmarillion. So have they legitimately got the law wrong because they don't have access to it? So they had to get it incorrect. They had to actively make it non-canonical because they don't own the rights to the canon. Oh, it's going to be a good show, isn't it? <laughs> But they're like, we resisted. We took up arms against Morgoth and decided to march out against him. It's like, yes. Are you going to talk about what you did on the way? And a legion of elves went to war. Fair enough. Are you going to talk about how you got those boats, love? <laughs> I've said many times I'm not a Tolkien lore guy. So if I know that, the showrunners should. And don't you think that's important mentioning, given the fact that it's integral to Galadriel's story? Just a thought. But yeah, we left Valinor. We just left. It was very uneventful. Nothing happened on the way. Journeyed to Middle-earth across the ocean in boats. It was completely uneventful. And there, there are enemies beyond count. Like dragons. I mean, at this stage, I would have at least worked in some way to say House of the Dragon. But maybe that's why I don't work for Amazon. I'd get sued. <laughs> But we get a big dragon fight and he sends the dragon down to the ground. The strange thing is the dragon lands in a path in the middle of all the fighting where there's no enemies. Like seriously, there's a landing strip in the middle of the army, especially for this dragon. Doesn't even hit anyone. I don't know what's going on. But then we get a weird little mix because this is a brother and he's fighting all the orcs. Now he doesn't go down like a man who's accepted his fate. No, we're going to make that face for some reason. But he does take a lot of people with him. He kills loads of them on his way down, despite the fact that he's grimacing all the time like he's just stepped on a Lego. You're lucky you're just fighting orcs, mate, and Lego hasn't been invented yet. That would be the true horror in the scenario. But then after taking out loads of them, for some reason he starts to get hugged by one and starts screaming. Doesn't try and fight back or anything. No, we're just going to start screaming. Oh! Oh no, you found my weakness! A hug! <laughs> And so for that, he just starts standing there and screaming. Like, he could easily fight this guy, he just decides not to. And the other guy's not fighting either, they're just holding each other there. It's bizarre. We're still padding out and he still hasn't moved, and nor is the guy fighting him. Still padding out, he still hasn't moved. I also want to draw your attention, I'm assuming you can see my mouse, to this guy over here. Just watch what this guy does with his sword as we pad out. Look, he's, st he's not even stabbing anything. Look, what's he, what's he do- what's he trying- What was that? It's the Disney trilogy of Star Wars all over again. But they said the war would be over over quickly and it wasn't. It dragged on for centuries. The war left Middle Earth in Cheeto dust. Now for some reason we don't get to see it like open our eyes and be covered in Cheeto dust again. Maybe too many people took the piss for that to be left in the series. What's funny though, strangely they kept this scene in. She finds a helmet and just looks around as if, oh I don't know what to do with this. In a perfectly clean fresh white dress. Everyone else, they're all dirty as hell. Her? Just put it on, walked on the battlefield, mate. Picked up a helmet, don't know what to do. I don't know if we could have got a hint with what you were supposed to do with it. I still want an explanation of how she got the ones on the top, though. That's basically all I care about in this scene. Then we get to a strange bit of the story. As she says, Morgoth was defeated, there was much sorrow, and orcs started to spread across the earth. There they are. It's not like they hid or vanished. They were multiplying ever greater in numbers under the command of Sauron. 
which I hope we all know. <laughs> so in a situation where orcs have spread across the earth and keep multiplying in numbers underneath a commander, what are you going to do? Are you going to think that clearly the war isn't over, or are you just going to think everything's safe and we're all fine? Couldn't possibly imagine. A cruel and cunning sorcerer, Sauron. I can change him! If, like, Sauron is hot, I feel like people will be like, I can fix him. But she says my brother vowed to seek out Sauron and destroy him, and now his quest is my quest, and that's why I'm going to grave rob his corpse. This dagger was clearly important to him. That's why he was buried hugging it, because it was important to him. Yoink! <laughs> Look, I know Lara Croft was supposed to go around raiding tombs, but I didn't know Galadriel did it as well. No, it's not an excuse if your brother gets marked by Sauron. It is weird later in the episode, though, when they say his mark is full of heat. Even centuries later, it never stops burning, and you're like, well, that did. One whose meaning even our wisest could not discern. Well, considering your wisest people don't even know how things float, I'm not really sure that's much of a compliment. Yeah, hang on, love, let me get back to that gargling. <laughs> then we get some tears. I do wonder if just beneath the camera is a guy cutting open onion. <laughs> some people want to see behind the scenes of the more complex issues. I just want to know, did someone cut up an onion? <laughs> but then we sailed off in the ships, which aren't ours, and we did horrible things to get. We're just not going to talk about that, it's fine. To the ends of the earth we hunted Sauron. Prepare for a montage of tiny people running over a landscape. It's like Peter Jackson's in the room. It looks like these elves actually leave footsteps in the snow. Year gave way to year, century gave way to century. That's one of those bumper stickers which is meant to appear deep and intellectual. And actually, she just said, time happened. Don't know how I'm going to keep up with this show. But she says as time moved on, more people forgot the threat. They just forgot that Sauron was wandering around with ever multiplying orcs. We know he existed before, we know we didn't do anything about him, and we know we didn't get rid of the orcs. Guess they just vanished! No, seriously, this is the story we're supposed to believe. You can understand if there's a big battle or something, but they were chasing him, they knew he existed. But the threat was ended. Oh, the challenge was just a memory. Yes, but it's within living memory. It's not like generations happened. These are the same people that suffered before, which are alive now. They should be annoyed about it! And some of them are. And when I say some of them, I mean specifically and only Galadriel, because she's special. But either way, they're going north and they decide to climb this ice face. She uses her dagger to climb with, even though an ice pick would just be objectively better. The only reason she has to do this dangerous jump is because she doesn't have an ice pick in both hands, where she could hold on with one and strike with the other. No, she's just got a dagger, which is why she has to do these death-defying leaps everywhere. Doesn't show you brave if it's just stupidity putting you in that situation in the first place. She's like, I wish I could be one of the people that forget, but I can't because I'm just so nice a person. But either way, they start climbing the ice face. Everyone else actually has climbing gear and ice picks, as you'd assume everyone would. It's dangerous, the hacking ice, it's falling on people. That's why they have to dodge it. But if you do notice, everyone else is climbing together. If one of them gets into trouble, the rest are near enough that they could go and help because they're literally in arm's reach away from everyone. They actually care about their fellow elves. It's very easy for the six or so of these other people to all help each other if they can. And yet, when they all reach a ledge, they start looking at where everyone is, just to make sure everyone's safe. And I'm assuming that's the bully that's grown up. I'm sure he still holds a grudge. I kind of think he's justified in it, though, when you find out that everyone else is waiting on this ledge, and look where Galadriel is. Oh yeah, up there on her own. Not only can no one help her if she gets in trouble, which she won't because she's absolutely perfect, but she would not be able to help any of those. She just ditches them completely, her own people. I think the showrunners think this is leading by the front, leading by example, and it's like, no, you're supposed to be a team. So they reach the top, and her ex-bully, who's actually being very polite, you know, he's using a proper title and everything, Commander Galadriel. 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 But, and yet, this is the response we get from her. Oh, I can't believe someone with dangly bits has dared to talk to me. What's he gonna do? Ask me to smile more. But of course, between the two of them, he's like, look, it's been years, we've not seen anything. Have you considered that everyone else in the entire world might be correct? And that actually there isn't a threat now, despite the fact that we knew there was and it vanished and we haven't done anything to it. None of us have considered that it might be hiding anywhere, except Galadriel. Night is closing in. How long can living flesh endure where even sunlight is to tread? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Night is closing in. Well, presumably the sun will rise again, so I'm not really sure what you mean. Or if we take it that there are some regions of Earth where the sun doesn't go and therefore are in permanent darkness, isn't that exactly where you would expect to find an evil Sauron person with a load of orcs that don't like daylight? 
I don't know. All I'm saying is if I was looking for some evil that was hiding, darkness is exactly the first place that I would go to. But she gives him the crazy eyes. You know, the ones you only normally see on a TikTok video. Maybe we should just camp here and then go home. All I'm saying is wouldn't it have been a better idea to suggest this at the bottom of the ice face that you just climbed? Yeah, we did go all the way to the top and now we got to go back down again. Like seriously, who are you? The grand old Duke of York? But they push on and head into some kind of snowstorm. We're all holding on to each other and we can't see a thing except in lightning. The person at the back falls over and the next one goes, Galadriel, we must stop because someone's fallen at the back. It's a very reasonable request. We keep moving. Why? There's literally no reason to keep moving. All you have to do is pick the person up and then help them move forwards and they'll move with you. This isn't a complex scenario with multiple moral choices. But then she turns around after he's gone, look, I'm not moving, stop. And then she realizes she may not want to turn into the living embodiment of Sauron and then should probably help the person. I couldn't believe it was even up for debate. But again, this guy wants to give up. And as he was the bully from the start of the episode, he's also going to be the punching bag for the rest of it. So he starts saying we need to go back and she sees glimpses of things in the lightning. And we don't need to go back. We're already there. And then it reveals itself. Was lucky someone fell over at the exact right time. What a coincidence. So then we get the scene from the trailer that we've already seen before. And this is where all of those orcs were with Sauron. She's like, there's so many more orcs. Far more must have escaped than we imagined. Despite the fact that I said at the start that they scattered across the earth and multiplied. I never thought there'd be a lot of them. This place is so evil, our torches give off no warmth. That's not a thing. You're thinking of ghosts, love, not Sauron. It's an easy mistake to make. But as they walk off, this hand on the bottom left moves. Ooh, tension. Doesn't work. Now, as she's walking along, she finds this sheet of ice and decides to punch it for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Look, don't ask for reasons why, and we're not going to tell you. Just assume that she knows the future and we needed to get into the next room. So she worked out how. Oh yeah, and she can smash down ice walls now as well with a fist. Empowerment! There is a lot of how did this happen or how did we know this? And the answer is always because we needed to, to get to the next bit. It's like there was a door filled in here. Bring it down. So they knock it down, despite the fact that she could apparently knock it over with her fist. Uh, just men, I'm sure they struggle a lot more. She's still getting followed by her bully, and we start investigating the area again, a scene you've seen before. Oh, what devilry is this? They were practicing some dark sorcery from the other side. It's never explained how I know this or what it means. Just believe me, it happened. All I'm saying is it looked like it went wrong. But what was their purpose? Surely it is lost to the ages now. That's what you may think, puny bully, but have you considered that you've got a strong person in 2022 to contend with? And the fact that you've said that no one can possibly find that out obviously means that she's going to work it out instantaneously. Whatever happened here was long ago. It was so long ago, no one will ever possibly come up with any way of working this out. Found it. <laughs> so this place is so cold, everything instantly freezes, even though there's no signs of that anywhere around them. There's water in that bottle. It's not frozen. It must be a magic bottle. The magic must stay in the water as it gets poured out of the bottle as well, because it's not freezing on the way down and it's not getting affected by the air. <laughs> Yeah, it's just the moment it hits the rock face, which is supposed to be superheated, that it immediately freezes around the superheated place. Makes sense to me. To be fair, this might make sense in a universe where a rock sinks because it looks downwards. He was here. Sauron was here. That's literally why you came here, isn't it? If you didn't expect to find Sauron here, why did you come here in the first place? I'm so confused. But well, she says, tell the others to rest and then we will go north, hunting him further. Apparently the symbol's there for orcs to follow. The problem is her king has told her that she can't go any further. And the bully's arguing that the mark is centuries old. Whoever left it could be long dead. I'm like, do you even know who Sauron is? Because you should do. Every elf should know who Sauron is. What do you think? He's got a mortal lifespan? He's saying we exceeded the king's orders months ago. We need to go back. We're going back. See, there is not a soul amongst our company who yearns for home more than I. Does anyone believe that? Because then she goes on to talk about Valinor, despite the fact that she left it voluntarily for actually selfish reasons. <laughs> oh, if only I could lead a land of my own. <laughs> no, let's pretend she's extremely virtuous. Then she talks about how she wants to go back because she can still feel the light of the trees on her face. I hate to break this to you, love, but they died a long time ago and you should know that. That's literally what prompted you to leave in the first place was the trees dying and you're like, but I can still feel them, I want to go back. Why? But she goes full Terminator until every trace of our enemy is vanquished. I can never go back. I'm like, okay. We could have had you going out and trying to save people, to protect the world, to fight evil, because that is a moral good and there's things in the world worth fighting for good moral messages. Instead, no, we get a selfish vengeance journey. Look, I don't mind revenge stories and stuff like Taken, but let's not try and pretend that this is a good moral uplifting story like it was advertised. <laughs> vengeance is definitely more House of the Dragon if you were aiming for uplifting story. But this guy's wandering off on his own down a cave. 
and he rolled poorly and triggered a Final Fantasy VII random encounter. Seriously, that was the best review line I've ever read. <laughs> oh no, it's a snow troll! So he gets chased and for some reason keeps looking behind him as if that's gonna make him run away faster. <laughs> He's lucky that the big massive thing behind him is just really slow and doesn't know how to walk for some reason. Although all of these people aren't as clever, so they immediately get annihilated by a block of ice and the fight kind of goes downhill from there. Although at least that does alert the other two that something's going on because they're screaming of snow troll! That didn't hear them. Yeah, yeah, elvish ears, you know, they're not the best. What do your elf eyes see, Legolas? What people didn't know is he was deaf as a post. So they come running in, and this is Galadriel's concerned face. I think that was accurate. And what they see is him absolutely battering every single person in that entire room. I'm pretty sure this is a person being thrown feet first at the camera. I'm saying I'm pretty sure because it's just a blur with a leg. Look, the show only cost a billion dollars. I'm going to be lenient with them on the graphic. So this snow troll just goes around and absolutely annihilates all of the other elves. That was a legitimate piece of fight choreography. I'm going to have a torch and just point it at them. That torch wasn't even going to hit the troll, by the way. <laughs> Look, it's just CGI. Why can't you let other people enjoy it? Look, I'm only pointing it out. But we continue with him just decimating every single elf in the entire room. Bet you can't predict what happens next. He annihilates two more with a punch who were just standing there waiting to get hit in the face. But then, after he's taken out the entire crew of people, there is but two left. Galadriel and the bully. Ah, uh, I've stood here and watched as you've decimated my entire army. I guess now is the time for me to draw my sword. And if you really want to make sure that a bully knows his position, obviously, he should get on his knees. There we go. This is the scene everybody's seen before and nobody wanted to see again, but welcome to it. Yeah, he didn't fling her, did he? The sword clearly just follows her up afterwards. It's almost as if she's being pulled on ropes or something and gravity doesn't apply. Look, it's not the worst bit of the scene. <laughs> He's about to squash this elf on the floor. But, oh no, I'm going to do, a, like, maybe a one-inch hit along your right ear. That'll do a lot. So she does a glancing blow on him, reaches the far end, and then starts spinning a sword. What have you been doing? Playing Star Wars The Old Republic or something? I don't even, like, it's not a lightsaber, dear. She's got her back to the troll, still just spinning the sword around. All of your friends are dying, and you're too busy emoting like it's Call of Duty. Maybe if you'd drawn your sword and attacked him when they were still standing, this all would have gone a lot better. But no, you see, I needed them to die so that I could show off. So she's spinning around, doing very light glancing blows against a massive target. She pulls back because she's seen Star Wars Obi-Wan Kenobi series. Everyone loved it when he did this, I think I should probably do this. We immediately cut to her teleporting over to the left, not in that stance great editing where she decides to go and be an ankle biter she does a roll for absolutely no reason whatsoever nothing was going to hit her that she had to duck under for instance comes to the front are we going to get some more spins i don't know at this point rather than turning around to fight him she decides to swing her arm back over itself to the point where you can get no force or leverage and just do this kind of th like this is awkward for me to do on camera she's an elf maybe her shoulders don't work like normal people i don't know i highly doubt she's going to get any leverage or force though in that position but it doesn't matter because we do another spin this time we actually hit him on the head so it's like one of the first ones that actually you know hurt and then ram it into his neck finally i'd like to point out during this entire thing the bully and the someone else that was behind them haven't even moved or even attempted to fight and i'm assuming everyone else there was like knocked unconscious or something because there's nobody else being in this entire thing just a 1v1 with galadriel empowerment although i do like when she twists the blade and pulls it out and it just like squirt that, that was cool <laughs> credit where credit's due although not in the next bit where she just starts spinning a sword again for no reason whatsoever who are you showing off to oh is it the two people behind you that were just standing there staring while you attacked a big massive creature and they thought yeah i can't be all bothered to help with that is that who you're showing off to? What, were you just spinning it round to rub it in their faces about how amazing you are? Wow. I suppose elves are supposed to live forever, but no one said they were adult. Especially not Galadriel. Everyone is in a circle immediately around her. We never should have come here. This is a horrible thing. We fought a troll. We can't fight a troll. Only Galadriel can fight a troll. She says we leave for soon enough. Then we go after Sauron. The order is given. We march at first light. Gentlemen to bed, for we leave at 9.30. Ish. Ish. But with that, it kicks off a rebellion. The bully's like, I will follow you no further because I actually respect the orders of my king. Seems reasonable, to be honest. At least it would be if he wasn't a complete idiot. And she's stunned. How dare somebody else have a different opinion than me? Do you not know I am your commander? I may have stood and stared while all of you died and left you on a mountain on your own and was going to leave you in a snowstorm. 
but I am your commander and you will do as I tell you. I wouldn't follow a commander that did those things either, so I think it's fair enough. And everyone draws their swords just as they did when they left Valinor, apparently, and they decide to lay them down. I mean, what, do you not need the swords for the journey back? What happens if you come across something dangerous, dude? Is this how they found elven swords in The Hobbit? It's just like, elves go around dropping them all over the place. They're like, literally in every cave. But she is apoplectic. She's like lip twitching. Oh my god, I can't believe that someone has actually dared to do something that I don't want. If it was just him, she'd probably behead him right there. This is almost as bad as when you sunk my paper boat that didn't float. It sailed. She actually even grips her dagger as if she's going to take all of them on. Although considering she was the only person that would fight a cave troll, maybe she was. They spend a long time zooming in on this symbol. It's it's not as intimidating as you think it is, dear. Da da da, it's the rings of power. Still a stupid name. But then we travel across the world, get a bit of trailer footage again, and there really isn't any need to talk about these people. They're just hunters. They walk past the hobbits and uh, they think the hobbits might be scary because they hide. They're very careful to call them half hobbits and not hobbits the entire show. We don't want to get sued. <laughs> Oh, the hobbits are so dangerous. What's the problem? They got short man syndrome. <laughs> I met this hobbit once and it was called Napoleon. <laughs> so they leave and it turns out the hobbits are actually following them. They absolutely don't look anything like the Nox from Stargate SG-1. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Whenever I look at them, I absolutely don't just see the Nox. It turns out the hobbits are actually all over the place. And then they've got this whistle they use to alert everyone even though the hunters are literally still within sight and would definitely hear the whistle. Apparently, they don't have any ears either. So the hobbits start appearing, like, out of trees. Lenny Henry comes out of a bush. He keeps sniffing as he does it, but looking like the filth and grime on him, I think the only thing he's going to be able to smell is himself. It's actually a very common occurrence among the hobbits. For some reason, these hobbits don't wash. And he's like, everything's clear. I'm sorry, are you saying you can smell the humans with that much filth and grime on you? Somehow, I don't think so. But everything starts to pop up out the ground. Turns out this entire building is just on the floor. The issue is, the sheer amount of them, they would not be able to hide very quickly. And the more they drag out of their houses onto the street, the slower it would be. It's like very counterintuitive. They've even got pots smoking in rocks and they're like, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll just cover that up. It'll be fine. Wagons and tables all with coverings on. I'm more interested in how they covered it up in the time for a hunter to walk over a hill than anything else. But the one commonality across every hobbit is they are just all incredibly filthy. But Lenny Henry starts opening a book. Oh no, I've noticed something in the book that's really important that I'm not going to say out loud. But apparently hunters aren't supposed to arrive here this early in the season. And she's like, well, it's happened before. And you remember how horrible that was? This is a potent of evil things to come yes somebody hunted an animal once it must be a prediction of the future for some reason but don't worry because we're about to get introduced to some more main characters welcome we're not supposed to be out this far well you know we can't just obey all the rules we've got told that twice in 30 seconds don't worry we're not laying it on a bit thick so she climbs through someone else follows her someone might have had one too many pies immediately gets pulled through by her friend falls in some mud luckily though didn't make her any dirtier than she already was one of the advantages of just being constantly filthy. Fallen anything, doesn't matter. One of these people fell in mud, one of them didn't. No one would be able to tell in a lineup. <laughs> but we've broken the rules, we've gone too far, and that means we found raspberries. Oh, the things we do for fruit. What follows is a massive long montage of them eating fruit, and no, I'm not making that up, it goes on forever. It's still going on. But then they find a footprint. I'm pretty sure that's a velociraptor. Sorry, wrong movie. It looks like a fitzy. A dog. It's a dog. You know how dogs love perries. Weirdly, I think my guess was closer. Although there's movement behind her on top of the mountain, for some reason, it doesn't attack them. No, why would a wild animal attack this very easy, tiny prey? <laughs> Maybe the filth scares them off. It's like, I I'm not, look, I'm not going to eat you until you wash, all right? But with that, she's had enough and she gathers them all. It's like, uh, we got to run because there's something very deadly out here and we probably should have actually obeyed what everyone told us to do. This is a character based on breaking the rules and the first lesson she learns throughout the entire series should have just obeyed the rules and not actually broken them. So uh, if she breaks them in the future, she's an idiot. But they all run off and the animal comes into play behind them and yet doesn't go for the tiny, easily huntable snacks, which are still on the screen. No, instead you hear it sniff the ground, even though we can see them on the far right of the screen. Elves have bad ears and good eyesight. Apparently dogs have bad eyesight and bad smell. Can't even smell them over there. I don't, I just, like, seriously. Now, welcome to Elrond. You know Elrond, the guy who leads armies as a warrior. You know, the person that Galadriel is, that's what he's meant to be. No, instead, he's going to sit in a tree and write Gilgalad's speeches for him. Although, weirdly, despite the fact that he's writing the speeches, he's not able to attend it. I don't, I, I don't know what this is meant to be. I think the show literally just wanted to humiliate him and show that there's elven lords above him. He's like, oh, Galadriel's here, yes! 
So we're in Linden, capital of the elves. And this is another scene that we saw from the trailers. And you get that a lot in this episode. I think it was a big mistake to keep doing these little 30 second to a minute clips. You probably should have just done a few trailers that actually made sense rather than cutting everything up into so many different pieces that it was impossible to track all of them and none of them really clicked together. Because all you've made is me like, I know that bit, I know that bit, I know that bit, I know that bit, even though none of it made sense before the show was released. And it's, it's not a great sensation. But we're going to start talking about something because we need to because it happens at the end. There's no reason we should talk about it, but we're going to anyway. Like, this is the capital of the elves. They must have seen this before. And for some reason, he's telling her as if she doesn't know about it. Like, she's never been here before. It, it's very strange. This is why Doctor Who had a companion who didn't know things. So he could explain it. You're not supposed to explain it to somebody who obviously would. But it's like, it turns out when you return to Valinor, you hear a song of our ancestors. And you are immersed in a life more intoxicating than anything you could possibly get in Middle Earth. Seriously, it's beginning to sound like a conversation with Joe Rogan. And he's like, look at you now. Commander of the Northern Army is Warrior Galadriel. Yes, Warrior Galadriel. The person who beats up children, leaves all her army on a rock face, waits for them all to die before she fights a cave troll, and then decides to 1v1 it as everyone else stands around and waits for her because she's spinning a sword around so much she might accidentally cut off one of their arms if they tried to help. Yes, yes, she's an incredible warrior. He's like, I expected you to come back covered in grime and mud. No, dude, those are the hobbits. She came back with frostbite and troll blood. How many of your people didn't come back because of your terrible leadership? That's what I want to know. <laughs> But as proof that he still lives, she brings back Sauron's mark. And she's like, I want to talk to the king. The king will let me go out there again. Yes, I've trekked all the way out there, trekked all the way back, just to trek all the way out there again. All I'm saying is if this is the normal behavior of the elves, no wonder you couldn't find Sauron for hundreds of years. And he's like, look, we can be official later. I, I care about you. I want to hear about you and your, your journey. Your harrowing journey. And this is where we find out that Galadriel's a really really nice person. Why, Elrond? You really have become a politician. Yeah, someone says, I want to hear about you, when you're like, oh, what an arse. I'm not some courtier to be placated by idle flattery. He said he wanted to hear about your journey, you crazy bint. If I go up to someone and say, how's your day been? I'm not some simple courtesan to be placated by your idle flattery. You know what I'm doing? I'm walking off because you're a lunatic. This is meant to be a woman where in the trailers she had a halo over her head. She's not meant to be a cow. I demand to speak with the king directly. What you get and what you demand are entirely different things, you entitled little insufferable. The best thing about this entire situation is Elrond's response. Oh, not again. I was so happy for her to be back. And then she started talking. <laughs> Don't worry, dude. We've all been there. We've all been there. And he says, you've made that plain, so I'm going to speak plainly as well. You had limits placed upon you. You were told you couldn't go over those, and you went over those. And now, you came back, and he's decided out of the goodness of his heart that he's not going to punish you for it. He's going to let you off. And yet, you dare come before us and demand special treatment. Who do you think you are? He doesn't quite put it like that. Alron might have done, though. Maybe he'd talk like that if he laid off the milk replacements. Instead, he phrases it as, maybe you'll find him a bit less receptive than you might hope. That's one word for it. Are you going to arrange an audience or not? If that's the tack you want to take with me, love, uh, not. Of course, that's not what Alron says, because in this, he's a complete puss. That is still your wish. You shall have it. That's definitely how that conversation would have gone among anyone on Earth ever. I always find it's the people who are completely unreasonable, demanding and entitled that win conversations, don't you? Like seriously, for some reason nobody washes in this place. I don't know, we're back with the hobbits. So she returns, get told about the hunters, and it turns out she's got caught. Uh, everyone knows that she went to a place she shouldn't have gone to. She was like, yeah, I was careful, but you did take a load of kids with you, didn't you? Yes. You can kind of put your own life at risk and then it'll just be your own fault. Maybe you shouldn't take the little wee ones, eh? And all of this is done in incredibly bad Irish accents. Like, incredibly just false, ah, top of the morning to me, laddie, kind of accents. It's just unfortunate none of them went, Turkey tree, top of the morning to me, laddie. If you thought my accent was bad, it's all like that. She starts wandering out trouble in the wilder world, but it doesn't matter because we're hobbits and we hide and we're always together and that's how we get through things. We don't actually worry about trouble, we just hide from it. We hide in the dirt, the muck, and the filth, presumably. I can't help but feel there's wonders in this world, beyond our wandering. And there's that quality script writing again. Seriously, this episode drags in so many places, and one of the places it really drags is anything to do with hobbits trying to make something interesting where it's based around them literally not doing anything, where their entire method in life is deliberately to have nothing happen to them. Maybe don't make them the focal point of your primary episode, eh? Everyone else has stuff to protect, but we, we just run away from everything. That's why we're so entertaining. Nobody goes off trail and nobody walks alone. We have each other. We're safe. And boring. You see, we 
is supposed to be round. I don't know if you heard that, but he literally said the wheel is supposed to be round. He said that as if the other guy isn't meant to realize. We're living in a world where you have to explain circles to people. Maybe it's just because the showrunners don't understand him. I don't know. But then we get Gilgalad handing out the crowns as celebration to recognize the feats that everyone did when they were out on their journey. And he's reading out Alron's speech. Some thought after Morgoth fell a new evil would rise, but clearly no one has. We haven't seen orcs in ages. It's all perfectly safe. Which isn't even the story they said at the start of the first episode. They said that Sauron appeared, orcs multiplied, and spread across the earth. It didn't say they were hiding at any point. They literally just retconned their own story without saying that anything had changed. But you know, they're already retconning Tolkien, so retconning their own story is sort of, uh, that's like exceptionally mild for them. <laughs> if the plot changes mid-episode, it's alright. It's alright. Nobody could have possibly known what we wanted. It was just a different interpretation we decided to take afterwards. We read the script and decided to, uh, think that the words meant something else. But now they have proven to us that our days of war are over. And if she accepts that crown, she will be accepting that as well. So he walks up to her as if in challenge, and she refuses to bend at first. Eventually she kneels, so she can at least be humble after a while of complaining about it. And she gets her crown. And as measure of our gratitude, these people will be able to go back to Valinor. We're definitely not sending them away because we think they'll cause trouble over here. That's, that's not what we're doing, folks. That's not what we're doing. It, look, in Game of Thrones, they get put on an ice wall, and here they get to go to a paradise. We're not competing shows, we promise. <laughs> I guess this is why she spoke about how no one misses home more than me. Should I fight evil or go home? Well, it turns out she actually can't make her mind up until the very last second, and I'm not going to make any comments about that being down to a type B. No, nothing. That metal neck brace on her in the armor gives a really weird effect, and I can't quite work out what it is. But we get to the fireworks show, presumably with magic in, because they're all, like, flapping their wings and stuff as butterflies. <laughs> We get the repeated music again because at this point no one's heard it repeated enough. Along comes Alrond carrying a couple of glasses of wine. Which at this point in the show I wouldn't blame anyone for needing a drink. It is said wine of victory is sweetest for those in whose bitter trials it has fermented. Again, that's supposed to be deep and it, it's just a bumper sticker, dude. It doesn't mean anything. Oh well, once you've been through hardship, everything feels nicer. Look, trust me, it's deep. It's deep and meaningful and you just don't understand it because you can't possibly compete on the level of the showrunners. It's definitely the reason. But she says, I don't feel victorious. You deserve. Let's not talk about what she deserves. Seriously, I saw a fight. I saw her stand there while her men died and she didn't even draw her sword. We definitely shouldn't talk about what she deserves. It's like, you deserve the honor of going back to Valinor. Your brother would be proud of you. And he's like, look, the king's given you a gift. You can't refuse it. She's like, yes, but what if I did? My brother said he'd go and kill Sauron and now it's my task because my brother isn't here. I want vengeance. Yes. This entire episode is her going around going, well, Sauron's out there and he's really evil. And everyone's going, no, he isn't. No, he isn't. No, he isn't. It's just you. It's just you. It's just you. And obviously she's the one who's correct. It, it really drags. It's really old and it's really obvious. Okay, maybe it is sweeter after it's been fermented in challenge. I actually get it now. I go to seek the enemy that escaped us in the north alone, if I must. Well, considering how you treat people, alone is probably your only option. You're just lucky that you had somebody to order people to follow you before, because I don't think they would have done voluntarily. How are you doing all the way down there at the bottom of the rock face? You okay? Oh, you die. Oh, that's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I know you're in trouble. So you find a cave troll. I'll wait. One lesson for TV showrunners everywhere. Do not make your central and main character completely insufferable. They're supposed to be a good person. I shouldn't be hoping that the cave troll wins. But it turns out that Alron's done everything she's asked for. He's already shown the king the sigil, and they're like, yeah, but it's just a sigil from hundreds of years ago that you found it doesn't mean anything. Obviously, they're all wrong, and she's correct. It is over. The evil is gone. Then why is it that I feel it in my heart? I think that's because we need the script to move on, and so we've got to make you just magically know things that you shouldn't actually be able to know i feel everything and he basically gaslights her and says well it's just because you've been at war all the time now you can't let it go it's your fault you're hanging on to things seriously next he's going to tell her to smile more <laughs> well i will say one thing that morford clark does really well is pissed off look at this conflicted i love that <laughs> It's like, I'm so angry, I'm twitching. The amount of spite and bile she put into one word, I find genuinely impressive. I'm just not sure that spite and bile should be the main thrust of your main character. <laughs> I'm so grateful that you haven't known evil as I have. You have not seen what I have seen. I've seen the Harfoots love. You've never seen anything dirtier than those little people. Although, we do get this face from Alrond afterwards. It's just like, oh, no. She's doing it again. She's doing it again. I can't believe. Oh, sigh. <laughs> Maybe get a different person to write Galadriel for the future episodes, you know? Maybe make a nice? I don't know, just, just an idea, just a thought. Evil does not sleep, Elrond. It waits. 
pretty sure you'll find out those two things aren't that different. If you're not in the nearby vicinity, it will make no difference to you whatever, whether it sleeps or waits. Either way, it's not moving or doing anything. It's not clever. I guarantee you, though, there are people in the audience going, oh, yeah, that's really deep. Oh, it doesn't sleep. It waits. Yeah. Oh, the complexity of that. Let me go and theorize on that in a paper for the next five months. Our complacency blinds us. Have you considered it's just because the person delivering the news delivers it in such a horrible way that nobody wants to listen to you? Have you considered it might be your fault? Were elves supposed to be sort of modeled on the Romans? Because it's just a Roman vibe I get from all of these people. There's only one line in this entire episode where I actually kind of got a bit of respect for Elrond. If you are wrong, I'm not if wrong. you are wrong. Look at her reaction to that. We get a gleef, momentary flicker of Elrond's spine, and that's the response. <laughs> Will you lead more elves to die? She is exceptionally good at that, I'll give her that. It's definitely a skill. I'm gonna lead you into a trap and then just wait for you all to die and then jump in and save myself. That's what we've seen so far. How many more statues would you leave in his place? I mean, she looks down, but that's not really the look of shame, is it? It's kind of the look of a child who's like, I know you're speaking sense, but I'm just going to ignore you and then do what I want anyway. It's like no one throughout history has ever refused. You will linger here forever for the rest of your life in misery and pain and war. Or you could go to paradise. I mean, it is quite a good sales pitch he's given up. An outcast, poisoned in dark whispers and dreams. It's like, if I go over here, do you think it'll be better? Because I'll still know evil is over here. Oh. If there's one thing worse than an insufferable character, it's an insufferable character talking about their feelings. Although a lot of people say her acting's dragged it down. I don't think so. I actually really like her acting in this scene. I just think it's the particular strength she has, and it does seem to be being incredibly angry, and this kind of horrified anger. Go there, and I promise you, if but a whisper of a rumor of the threat you perceive proves true. It's a script, isn't it? It's a script. <laughs> yeah, go to paradise, go to paradise, and if you actually turn out to be correct, then I'll solve it for you. It's like, well, she could come back, right? She could come back. I know it's a long way and it's a big journey, but if you can go one way, you can come the other. It's fine. It's like, no, you should just leave it to me. I'll solve it all for you. You fought long enough. Put up your soul. Without it, what am I to be? I don't know. A miserable, angry cow. It's like, that seems to all be that's left. I can understand why you're upset. That would be too. What you have always been. That's not a sales point. You could have said a nicer person. One that people actually want to spend time around. My friend. What? In this land of elves, dwarves, orcs, and magic, the least believable thing in this scenario is that Galadriel has a friend. You forget we've seen her in the show. And, but I do like Elrond in this scene, the whole trying to convince her that he cares. I'm just not really sure it's Elrond. It's certainly not the same Elrond as before. It's like, oh, this is how he transformed into that person. Yes, but was he ever this person? That's what I want to know. I don't have a problem with him transforming into that person. I'm about where he starts is the problem. There's no way that guy becomes a warrior, I'm telling you. But now we move on to another group of people that we didn't need to talk about. Like I say, first episode is supposed to hug you. It's not for going around all of your cast and introducing them. That's, that's, that's not what the first episode for. You can introduce people and expand on characters in later episodes. The first episode should bring you into the series, hook you, and make you want to see more. That's its only reason for being. But along come a couple of elves. I've already heard what one of the elves says about this scene. It's not good. Because you may think they're talking about elves. Oh no, this is actually an allegory. You know, something that Tolkien never wanted in his work. But we're going to have it put in here, folks. So I hope you enjoy that. Also, he's got six arrows, maybe seven in his quiver. Really came prepared. But he walks past this guy's board game and immediately tells him how to win because he's just super mind-blowing smart. Obviously is. O obviously he's got to be amazing at literally everything. Is there going to be anything he's not good at? That's what I want to know. But the bar keeps talking about poison and everyone goes silent as he walks in the bar. Ta-da! That single mother has a forbidden romance with him even though neither of them are supposed to have one. So they've got to keep it silent. She leaves while he arrives. Nothing suspicious about that. But it turns out he's doing patrols looking for sort of evil, I think. Like general signs of evil, poison grass people getting poisoned, darkness approaching the world. You know, he's on a watchtower in the distance. The far-flung regions of the land, keeping an eye out for Sauron. Oh, let it go, knife ears. I don't know if you're getting the subtle allegory that we're putting in the show. Oh, you're just writing too much into it. No, I'm not. It's from the Elf's interview. When are you people gonna let the past go? You people. There are times where you just, you know, you walk through a door, you're not expecting anything, and then you just ever so subtly get hit in the face with a sledgehammer. Welcome to Lord of the Rings, folks. I hope you enjoy your stay because we've got eight more episodes of this and then four more series. Congratulations and welcome. Pass this with us all. If I was a director, I would have got him to say that line again because it's one of those things where you can work out what he said, but he didn't actually pronunciate it at all. The past is with us all. Past is with us all. You what? I tell you what though, this town he's by, they all just look like they don't know what they're doing. They're just kind of dirty. 
were unskilled people that wouldn't really be talented at anything in particular, certainly don't care that much about fashion, and yet they can cut this guy's hair to within a millimetre of its life. Whether we like it or not. The showrunners certainly don't appreciate the fact that there is a historic law they've got to obey. <laughs> You're living proof of that. <laughs> but this guy's like, one day our true king will return and pry us out of your grip. He's... You see, this town was all loyal to Morgoth. Kind of makes it a bit awkward then that that guy actually is uh, getting it off with one of the single mothers in the town, doesn't it? And he leaves because, you know, he doesn't really care about his job. No, he's thinking with a different head. That one. She gives him a little pot full of seeds for healing. And oh, if only we could do Romeo and Juliet star-cross lovers of people that aren't supposed to be together. They're two families. They just don't like each other. One is pledged to Morgoth and the other is pledged to kill Morgoth. How are these two ever going to get along? While also heavy-handedly hitting you in the face with allegory. The good old Morton Bailey, eh? It's not subtle and it's not clever. It's just like you're gargling with your own urine. You crush the petals. You crush them. Gently. Yes, that'll be one of those times where you gently crush something. But despite the fact that they've been together for a while at this point, I assume, for some reason, he's telling her how elves work. Surely she should know. He's like, no, we live forever. Our wounds kind of just heal on their own, so we don't have magic. Have people that make things of beauty, and that heals our souls? I, he said it, not me. I don't know. But out comes the barkeep and he sees them together and he's absolutely not suspicious at all. Just joking, he's incredibly suspicious. I know what you two have been doing. I bet you've been getting hold of his seed. He's like, anything to report? No, no, you do realize what you're doing, right? You do realize you're putting me in trouble. He's like, yeah, I don't care if you're in trouble. <laughs> so instead of caring that you might get someone innocent in trouble, he just goes, you smell. Yeah, rotting leaves. And you talk too much. Seems most of the main characters on this show are just horrible people. Yeah, it's that's what we're gonna have to put up with. So they've got these god towers off around the sort of periphery of their lands looking for evil things. And he's like, look, only twice that all of history as a human and elf ever tried to get together and all of them died. And he was, yes, you don't need to tell me. I was one of them. I can't even physically exist in this world. And so we just had to make an exception and just write a bit of story in that never happened. But they get a message from the king. The war is over, Sauron. Actually, he doesn't exist. We thought he did, but he doesn't. You've just wasted your entire life at this outpost doing nothing because actually no evil existed all this time. Yep, you've spent 83 years doing absolutely zip. Congratulations, please come home. Thank you. None of them seem mad that they've wasted 83 years of their life because the danger they were here to look for doesn't actually exist, apparently. They say the landscape has changed over the 79 years I've been here, but the men haven't. They're the same people that pledge themselves to Morgoth. Men do not change. We actually weren't here to keep an eye out for Sauron. We were here to keep an eye on all the people in that village who were all evil. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And he's like, no, they can't be evil. Humans can change because I love one. Ah! Yes, this is the romance section of the episode. It was boring enough, and now we're getting worse. But we get introduced to the single mum and her child. Single mums were really common in this time period. The kid doesn't like the elf, but, uh, you know, not his decision really, is it? And he comes to see her one last time before he has to leave. But their meaningless exchange gets interrupted by the kid. There's someone here to see you and he's brought his cow. No, it's not Galadriel. And he says, look, do you heal animals too? My cow has some kind of sickness and... Well, you see what happens next? Yep, I fully agree with that. You didn't need a vet to diagnose that one. This guy who has absolutely no knowledge of animals whatsoever is definitely the best person to diagnose an animal. So the vet is actually going around inspecting the cow and doesn't realize something. Pretty obvious to spot. He says, I think she might have ate something. And then this guy gets that out of its order. The vet didn't spot that. And the owner's like, what is that? What is that? It's like, I don't know. At this point, I think we can safely say that, um, shouldn't be there. None of them seem that freaked out by it, to be honest. It's a bit weird. He doesn't even wash his hands. But he says the cow traveled off a day, and so it probably ate something, which, which will have given it whatever the affliction. And she's like, I'm coming with you. Nobody knows why. This isn't her job or her duty, and, uh, there's no real reason for her to go. But for some reason, they both go, and the kid decides, this is where I'm going to show my mate this new sword I've got. So him and the evil Morgoth worshipper go to find this new sword. Well, he's getting asked about whether his mom's having it off with the elf. So yes. It's like, it's a lie. She wouldn't do that. I mean, you've got eyes. You saw him yourself, do you? But they found this base of a sword. Dun, dun, dun. Does anyone care? I don't. It's got the brand of Sauron on it. Oh, no. Ah. At this point in the episode, I was so bored. This had literally zero impact on me. I'm watching it twice. It's worse the second time around. Because this guy's just staring at it as if, oh yeah, that, you know, a fiery brand on a sword. It's perfectly normal. I'm just going to act as if it's all normal. But don't worry, because Galadriel's going back to Valinor. Absolutely nothing will go wrong here, I'm sure. She has passed beyond my sight. She's on her way to Valinor. And this is where we find out that actually Galadriel was right all along. Because of course she was. And what's more, both type Bs knew it. 
That's why they had to send her away. We can't have her being right about anything. We've got to handle this ourselves. We are, after all, people of the dangly bits. You see, if she continued her search, she may have actually made the evil worse. It literally doesn't make any sense, but it gets worse. Or well, the same wind seeks to blow out a fire may also cause its spread. Welcome to the bumper sticker. We're going to try and sound so intelligent and deep. Well, actually, just gargling again. We're back to the gargling. But this scene has a new tactic, a new danger to viewers, because you see, it actually took me three hours to get through this episode, and this scene is why I fell asleep during it. As you saw in that last clip, these people do not speak like normal people, and their speech is ever so slowly. Honestly, watching this scene is like you're watching people move and speak through treacle, and all I want is for them to talk at a normal pace, please. It's like, so you believe that the shadow is actually real after all? He's like, yes, yes, uh, we did realize that. That's why we had to send her away. It's like, but even though we know that she was right after all, you were correct to send her away. I tell you, those people were dangling bits, eh? Always manipulating people, always just being really nasty, evil, manipulating people and lying to you. They, just, they lie all the time. It literally makes no sense to send her away when she's been right about hunting something all the time. In your first episode, you've based the foundation of your entire plot on sand. Well done, folks, well done. But he's like, despite the fact that Sauron probably is real, uh, we still need to look at the sunrise and move forwards anyway, despite the fact that we know evil in the world is brewing. Have you ever met Keller Brimbo? He's about to embark on a new project of singular importance. I think you should meet him. This has absolutely nothing to do with why we sent Galadriel away. And in he arrives, the person that for some reason managed to look like an 80 year old granny. It's definitely a dress by the way. Well, hello, this is our summer fashion look. Today, I'm sporting the maternity wear of the season. Then we get Lenny Henry moaning about the stars. Apparently the stars and the sun in the sky at the same time. It's all horrible, it's all horrible. And he's like, you're far too meddlesome and troublesome to be born a hobbit. Are you quite certain you're not part squirrel? Ah, ah, Tutti Tree, please tell me. The stars, the skies are strange, my laddie. I hate the accents. Skies are strange. The skies are strange, my laddie. So we get a shot of the sun and the stars. And this is where he decides to tell her, you do realize that your entire town is evil, full of evil people that all worship Morgoth and would again, right? And she's like, well, I was born there. Yeah, that's his point. You're talking about my friends. They're good people. They're nice people. No, they're evil people and worshipers of Morgoth. Although She-Hulk let the abomination out of prison, so, you know, apparently we just let everyone off nowadays. It's like, no, I know they can change. That's why I came with you. I hate all of this scene. I don't know why it's in. It's so boring. Look, you didn't need to put this in. If you wanted things for people to ship, they would have shipped everyone else anyway. Now you so like, no, we're just going to force it onto the screen. Oh, so I do not care. I don't care. We could have just had this fade to black in a room somewhere. You literally would have moved on the plot in the same way. But, oh no, something's happening. There do be fire. The entire town's on fire. Maybe if you hadn't been making puppy dog eyes at each other, you would have realized earlier. But as we approach Valinor, for some reason, we brought these extra people with us who are only here to take our swords and armor off. Seems really inefficient and a waste of their time, to be honest. Do they sail the boat back? They don't really look like sailors. Now, she is refusing to give up her blade. And the guy's like, look, I've got new hair. I've just been to the barbers. How dare you not give up your sword? Oh, well, if I have to. And she gives it up. Then come a flock of birds and they all just start singing. This goes on for ages. Everyone starts singing on the boat. It's quite freaky, actually. It's like a cult. And then this cloud parts and light appears. The trees died and no light comes from them. So I don't even know where the light's supposed to have appeared from, to be honest. And then we get a flashback. Do you know why some people see the light and some people see the darkness? Why does the stone sink? Yes. It's so clever. We've looped back to the start. Even though it didn't make any sense at the start, we're going to pretend it makes sense now. This is all really deep. And if you don't understand it, it's just because it's going over your head. It's not that it doesn't make sense. And at the same time, a shooting star flies across the sky. Everyone's going to look up. Oh, I don't know what's going on. Is it Batman? Meanwhile, all the other elves on the boat are all like, yes, walk into the light. Walk into the light. Because there is no other connotation between, yes, come with me, walk into the light at all. No, it's all fine. He's like backing away. I don't want to go to Valinor. Don't you understand? The stone looks downwards and the boat floats because it looks up. That's how buoyancy works. This shooting star go past this shooting star goes past literally everybody. <laughs> they're very lucky they're all nearby. Even the Ents see it. And he's like, give me your hand. We can go into the light together. I'm like, oh, you're on a boat. Why don't you just sail forwards? And she's refusing to give him her hand and she's looking back at her dagger, trying to make a choice between the two. Oh no. But what if the light isn't actually the real light? What if it's evil light? Because it comes from underneath. It's shining in the darkness and I'm the rock. I'm not joking. This is literally the plot. Sometimes we cannot know. 
Till we have touched the darkness. Bumper sticker. No, it's it's really clever. You just don't understand it. I've not even seen episode two yet. I'm going crazy already. The best things are fermented in hardship. So they all get eaten by the light. And he's like, no, the light is approaching me. You need to take my hand. I don't know why he's so obsessed with taking her hand as they go to the light. It's like nobody else is holding hands. It's literally just him. Not creepy at all. It's like, ah, no, I think I won't. I don't even know what the screen's meant to be. Like, seriously, what? What is that expression? Then she cries again for some reason. Oh, I'm not gonna get to go home. It's your own choice, love. Then finally, the hobbit sees it land next to them. And then, in the most stupid decision possible, Galadriel decides to jump off the boat into the ocean. Could have only been made stupider if she was still wearing her armor. I'm not joking, she's in the ocean. And then those doors seal up and she's left floating in the ocean. Well, you're dead. You're dead. You're in the ocean. You don't have a boat. There's no land near you. You're just in the ocean. Can't go anywhere. You're dead. Episode one, she's jumped into the ocean and she's now died and she can't get out. Thank you. That was, it was a, it's a one episode mega series, a billion dollars on one episode. Oh, what a sight to behold it was. Thank you and goodbye. No, there's no way out of this. Anything out of this will be stupid. I haven't seen episode two. I'm assuming it's going to be stupid. She's literally just swimming in the ocean. This is insane. She has no plan, no forethought. No wonder she let all the team die in the military. Oh no. But then Gilgalad finds a leaf and it's got, clearly it's being affected by some darkness like that cow. I don't mean Galadriel. And the fire is here. The shooting star left a crater. What is it? Oh no. Ah, it's a person. Look, at least he came down wearing stuff to protect his dignity. Oh my god, I can't believe that a man came down in a meteorite. Meteorite. Wow. Welcome to a beautiful mess. I can actually understand why some of the reviewers said what they did. Because I think this show will come down to what you value in a piece of work. If you just have the visuals, this show has them. It looks good. It's the scenes and the sets in the forest, when the birds come down, it, it does look beautiful. That's what you're after. You just have to landscape shots. Probably enjoy the show. If you're after more though, that's where it begins to fall down. Now, now there's a lot of people that know a load about Tolkien that I'm sure will be able to take away all of the details and the things that they've broken. That's not me, but even I at the start in the intro know that they broke some things. <laughs> yes, Morgoth was the one that took the light from the trees, was he? Yes, I'm sure he was. But the major weakness for me in this was the characters, the script, the plot, and the entertainment value of the piece. Because I was bored during this entire episode. When your first episode is meant to drag you into the piece kicking and screaming, just desperate to know what's happening next. No, none of that happens here. We spend so much time on a romance that, like seriously, who cares about that? And teaching you that Galadriel is actually insufferable and no one wants to be around her. Justifiably. And yet, she's always right. She was right along and it's because she was right. That's why she needed to get sent away. People are just so intimidated by her. It's not because she's insufferable. They don't want to be around her. No, no, she's just, she just happens to be so right all the time. And we get these lines, multiple pieces throughout the piece, which you can tell they think are really deep. You can tell they think are really intelligent and are talking past people saying lines which have nothing to do with the last line and meaningless bumper sticker statements are not good script writing and they're not deep. And yet they seem to be one of the main tricks in modern entertainment to try and make people think that that's what's happening on the screen. And they'll come back and go, no, you just don't understand it. It's like, no, I do understand it. That's the problem. That whole line about stones and boats was stupid when I heard it the first time. To make it the conclusion of your episode as the big finale? No, please, no. And then you've got the big question of does this feel anything like Lord of the Rings? And I think the answer is a resounding no. There's one soundtrack that loops through most of this episode and um, it gets really monotonous, I've got to be honest. It's not a bad soundtrack per se. I'm not sure whether it really fits Lord of the Rings, but it, as quality wise goes, it's decent. I just don't want to hear it all the time. And I think the visuals and the characters and how it happens, it could be literally any fantasy realm on Earth. What you've made doesn't feel like Lord of the Rings because it was never meant to be. You didn't like Tolkien's world. You didn't like his characters. And so you had to change them. You've made them. We've had to make this for the modern world. It was only right that it reflects now. The thing is, Tolkien didn't reflect now. Tolkien was never meant to reflect now. It was meant to reflect Britain it, throughout history. It was meant to be a British mythology. Any signs of that here? Now, I've not seen the second episode, but I have heard people say that that improves it. So maybe my opinion will improve tomorrow when I do the second review. But at the moment, my key takeaways were 
This doesn't feel like Lord of the Rings. It doesn't feel like Middle Earth. It doesn't feel like Tolkien. And I don't think that last bit's gonna change. We've already heard from the cast, the crew, and the showrunners that that's not really important to them. It was very important to them that they changed it. This was a necessary redress of balance. You can thank your cast for that one. So you're never going to be able to make a show which actually respects that. And everyone understood that going into the show. But even if we put that to one side, the sheer entertainment value of the show itself. Was I entertained when I was watching this show? No. There are so many decisions that don't make sense. There's so many lines that were awful. But the main through point throughout most of the episode was just I was bored. And there is nothing worse for me to say about a piece of entertainment then it's boring, because that means it's not entertaining. There is no lower thing you can say about a show than that it's slow, it's a slow burn, or that it's boring. I would rather something gratuitously horrible like She-Hulk than something that was boring. If there's one state in life I cannot stand, it's to be bored. And yet that was my main promotion throughout this entire thing. It's in this episode, beautiful, isn't enough to drag me into this series. It's not enough to entertain me. I need more. I need a script. I need characters which people can actually like and root for and not hope that a troll hits them in the face. And most of all, I need to be entertained. And none of those three things were in the episode. What I was, was bored. And that is literally the most horrible thing I will ever be able to describe entertainment as. I despise things which are average and boring far more than something that is absolutely horrible like She-Hulk. And that might be something that's weird, but it is something that's fundamental to how I review things. But hey, episode two tomorrow, maybe we'll find out that's better. Maybe something will happen in that episode. Let's find out tomorrow. But for now, that's it from me. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you liked the video, press like, subscribe. More reviews like this in the future on Lords of the Rings and other shows like She-Hulk. But for now, that's it from me. Like the video if you liked the video. Subscribe for more, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.